Children are supposedly the most vulnerable in our society. Their teenage years are meant to be a time of innocence, a chance to discover who you are and learn the rules of life. But what if you don't follow those rules? For some teenagers, it is a time when they have killed another person. Behind these innocent-looking faces lurk the minds of killers. Over 10 years, Ireland has produced 16 teenagers who have killed. Some are guilty of manslaughter, while some have killed in cold blood. All of the killers have been male. What is going on in our society that makes the most vulnerable turn into the most violent? Why are we producing children with no regard for the rule of law? What has turned these kids into Ireland's teen killers? In southwest Ireland, the city of Limerick was in the grip of a long-running gangland feud for a decade. Between 2000 and 2010, clashes between rival gang members resulted in up to 20 murders and hundreds of shootings and attacks. These are the young faces of that feud, teenagers being led by Irish prison guards out of court and into their prison van. This is 17-year-old Richard Tracy, 18-year-old Shane Kelly and 17-year-old Joseph Keane. The three began laughing and nudged each other as the sentences were handed down. That is the culture you have to put on that show. That is one of the huge negative consequences of detention anyway, is that the young person has to behave in a certain way. Otherwise, that young person is going to get a tough time from his peers. They haven't been found guilty of petty theft or joyriding. They have been found guilty of beating to death another teenager. Darren Coughlin was chased on foot before being brutally assaulted by the gang. They then left him on the side of the road to die. These are the faces of a new breed of violent youth, the teenager who is ready to kill. A lot of young people that I met over the years that would have committed very serious crime would have had major personal difficulties in their life themselves. Their level of responsibility would have been questionable from a very young age. Uh, the culture they grew up in, where, where violence would be part and parcel of living, uh, they, the people who they would admire, their role models, would often be very negative role models where they themselves would have been very active in violent crime. Although he was 18 at the time of the killing, Shane Kelly had already amassed 71 previous convictions. Two weeks before he was involved in the death of Darren Cochran, Joseph Keane had himself been shot at in Limerick, but escaped unharmed. Teen killers aren't exclusive to the ganglands of Limerick. Many have come from Ireland's capital city. Talla in West Dublin lies where the city outskirts meet the Dublin mountains. This urban sprawl has seen some of the most violent and brutal gang feuds in Ireland. Organized criminal outfits, selling and trafficking drugs have turned areas of Tala into a notorious killing zone. Gangland feuds have caused huge negative destructive consequences for all people living in the communities where they're prevalent. And they are they're confined to the a, a small number of areas. They're also confined to the most disadvantaged areas. They're not in middle class areas and they're not in affluent areas. And we need to ask that question. Why is it that they're so prevalent and so much associated with social deprivation? Out of this world would come a cold-blooded murderer aged 17. In January 2009, the tit-for-tat shootings in Tala had got so out of hand that over two weeks, ten men had been shot, four of them fatally. I think it's certainly a, a newish development that teens would be involved in what we ordinarily know is gangland hits. It's showing the adult nature of teen crime in Ireland now. These people are behaving like the worst criminal um, adults that we've ever known. They're imitating what they see and their role models are people who have committed very serious crime or who are seen in the community to be, you know, to be in control and they use violence to do that. One of those victims was Stephen O'Halloran, a father of three who was shot dead by David Patchell whilst sitting in a parked car. The victim and his killer were just 20 years of age. 
Did you know the young fella that died? Ah, yeah, Stephen, yeah. yeah. What sort of a man is he? Well, he's young like the rest of them, you know what I mean? Teenager. Thinks the, the world is that ice. This was just one killing in a bitter cycle of feudal retribution. As morality declined, so too with the age of the victims and their killers. Drug culture has brought guns and violence uh, in, into uh, you know, mainstream society in many, many areas in Ireland today. And I have no doubt myself is a major contributory factor to the ultimate uh, committing of homicides by young people. There's a social disconnection often with people from those backgrounds. Very sad, uh, but it's a reality. They are disconnected from what mainstream society expects of them. One of O'Halloran's gang was a teenager, Daniel McDonnell. He lived on a housing estate at Brookview Lawns. He had a disruptive history and upbringing. He was 14 when Stephen O'Halloran was shot dead. McDonnell had left school the same year and had spent the next three years maturing into a killer. The risk factors for becoming a homicidal teen are mostly involving a history of violence in your own early life and exposure to violence, having been abused and or severely neglected as a youngster and as a teenager, extreme disruption in your environment, and also a certain uh, inability to regulate your own behavior. He amassed numerous convictions, including possession of firearms and ammunition, threatening to kill or cause serious harm, and violent behavior in a police station. In 2012, revenge was on the minds of O'Halloran's gang. McDonnell was now 17, on the cusp of adulthood, and on the brink of murder. In the case of Daniel McDonald, this was a young man who was trying, I think, at the psychological level to achieve his own sense of significance and superiority by proving to others, particularly gangland members, that he alone could extract revenge on a wrong that allegedly was done within the gangland system. The gang wrongly believed that a local family were involved in O'Halloran's death and they set about taking retribution. That family were the Morans, settled travelers who lived on Drumcairn Avenue, just 200 yards away from McDonald's home. In February that year, Christy Moran, accompanied by two male friends, collected his fiancee Melanie from the tram terminus in Talla. Christy was sufficiently concerned about her welfare that he wouldn't let her walk home. Christy was 21 and Melanie was 16. Originally from England, Melanie McCarthy McNamara was also from a family of settled travellers. She was the eldest child of Stephen and Melissa and was like a second mum to her four siblings. After collecting Melanie, Christy received a phone message to come to the house of one of their friends. Someone had been throwing rocks at the windows. Believing they needed their help, they drove straight there. They didn't realise they were being lured into a trap. Ironically, the home was on Brookview Way, just yards from the home of Daniel McDonnell. As they pulled up outside their friend's house, a lookout was hiding in nearby bushes. Seconds later, a stolen black Hyundai Santa Fe with 17-year-old Daniel McDonnell inside rolled up alongside the parked car. Christy was in the front passenger seat alongside the driver. Melanie was sitting in the back with their other friend. As the black Hyundai pulled alongside, a shotgun was aimed at Christy and the driver. The parked Nissan lurched forward in a knee-jerk response to the danger, and instead of the shotgun being discharged at the young men, Melanie took the full force of the blast in her face. The 17-year-old had just fatally shot an innocent 16-year-old girl in cold blood. I heard the shots and uh... I told my daughter to get in then, my daughter's 16 as well, so it was just, it could have been anyone's daughter that got shot, you know. Realising their mistake, the killers panicked and fled. Melanie was driven straight to hospital, but died soon after. She had suffered cranial cerebral trauma, incompatible with survival. The range of the shot blast was four feet.
every, I suppose, fundamental civilized quality that you would expect and, and require in a society is missing in that case, where you can shoot somebody like, uh, you know, by mistaken identity and sort of, well, I made a mistake, sort of stuff, and taken a life. But that's becoming more and more prevalent in the way people are behaving and the way crime has changed. Sometimes that young person is used by godfather figures who are well removed from the coal face and from the street, uh, and they're instructed often to do things, uh, you know, tit for tat. In the hours after the shooting, the stolen black 4x4 was found abandoned. It had run out of petrol and had not been burnt out. The double barrel shotgun was soon discovered along with two discharged cartridges. CCTV also captured the identity of one of the gang as they fled. Immediately a manhunt was launched to track down the killers. And I want to reassure the public that we will give them every support that we can. But likewise, I hope that the public will give us the support that we need to bring the culprits of this terrible crime to justice. Police fears escalated as pictures of the suspects were posted on teenage social media site Bebo. Immediately, dozens of the site's teenage users issued death threats against them. This was the violent and virulent teenage world of Daniel McDonnell, his friends and their many enemies. A young girl had been murdered. Here somebody had crossed the Rubicon, not just from non-traveller gang into traveller gang, but from male to female. Weeks after her death, heavily armed units from the Emergency Response Unit of the Irish Police patrolled the Tala area to prevent retribution. We will be doing all that we can to reassure the public that we have sufficient resources on the ground and very experienced investigators working on this particular investigation. McDonnell and his accomplice had fled into hiding, fearing a revenge attack, but also fearing their own crime boss. Ten days after Melanie's killing, McDonnell was hunted down by Irish police to an apartment in Athai, County Kildare. He was arrested along with his accomplice, 21-year-old Keith Hall, who was identified by CCTV footage. As McDonnell was brought back to Tala Courthouse, Melanie's family waited outside for a glimpse of her teen killer. McDonnell was detained for a number of days at Tala Garda Station, where he occupied a cell on his own. Despite being interviewed a dozen times, he made no comment to questions. It was during this time that Gardi noticed fresh graffiti written on the wall of McDonnell's cell, referring to the murder. The graffiti was tagged Dano McDonnell and D McD. Alongside, the teenager had written a chilling and self-incriminating reference to Melanie. After he was charged with Melanie's murder, McDonnell was transferred to St. Patrick's Institution for Young Offenders. For his own safety, he was again detained in a solitary cell on B3 landing in the children's detention facility. Four weeks later, McDonnell handed his prison officer two letters for posting in unsealed envelopes. Following prison protocol, the officer read them before posting them, but they would not be dispatched. The letters directly incriminated McDonnell in Melanie's brutal killing and were handed over to police. They gave clear insight into the mind of the teen killer. He seemed to have absolutely no concern for the fact that this might amount to evidence or no understanding of it. Or if he did have understanding, he didn't care. I'm more inclined to think the latter. He just didn't care because he'd made his mark. The first letter was written to his elder brother, Lee McDonnell, and bragged about the killing. It directly referenced that he, Daniel McDonnell, had shot Christy Moran's girlfriend with a shotgun. He's striving to put himself from the one down position of being the little brother to a position of parity with the big brother by exaggerating the intensity of his own violent emotions. A second letter was addressed to his girlfriend, Stephanie Tute. This letter started more apologetically but soon descended into violent bravado. Again, it amounted to an admission to the murder. I don't know what his motivation is to write to his girlfriend in a more 
uh, humane, if you will, way as opposed to how he wrote to the older brother. Is he trying to soften himself in her eyes and perhaps develop some compassion for her to him? It's difficult to say, but it's a very interesting letter and perhaps the best one that gives us a more nuanced view of Daniel's total personality. Nearly two years after Melanie's killing, Daniel McDonnell stood trial and pleaded not guilty to her murder. His fingerprints had not been found on the getaway car or the shotgun. His confessional letters from prison and the graffiti writings on his cell wall were the only evidence against him. Despite this, after a seven-day trial, he was unanimously found guilty by a jury of six men and six women. She was with her mommy all that night, and her last words to her mommy, I'll see you tomorrow. She's still waiting for her daughter to come in the door. Daniel McDonnell, now aged 19, was sentenced to life in prison. Best news I've gotten my whole entire life, that I'm delighted that Judge Kearney found it in his comfort to give him 20 years. So delighted. I'm going to celebrate for the week. And I hope he rots in there. The leafy village of Clonsilla lies near the Dublin Kildare border. Surrounded by lush farmland, it's traversed by the Royal Canal and the main railway line, linking Ireland's capital to the Midlands and the west of the country. It seems a beautiful and safe place to raise a family. Michaela Davis and Jonathan Byrne grew up in Clonsilla and lived less than 15 minutes apart. Michaela lived in the semi-detached house in the village Porterstown with her parents and brother. Across from the house is a green area for kids to play and railings separating it from the canal and train tracks. Jonathan Byrne lived nearby in Lahunda Downs with his parents and older brother. In the summer of 2010, Michaela and Jonathan were dating. Outwardly, it may have seemed like a normal teen romance, but there was one major problem. Jonathan was 18 years of age. Michaela was just 12. The best single piece of evidence to an individual's true emotional age is the age of their closest friends, and in this case, the preferred romantic partner. Jonathan, age 18, chronologically, isn't age 18 emotionally. He's more age 12 or 13. When Michaela's parents discovered she was dating an 18-year-old, they insisted she end the relationship immediately. Michaela did as she was told. But when she finished it, she told her parents that Jonathan had been reluctant to break up. After the split, Mr. Davis saw Jonathan hanging around their house. He told him to go home. Once a person fixates on a loved object and cannot get that out of their head and it takes over the entire core of their being, the inability to be close to that object is a deep and threatening wound. This was an important time in Michaela's young life. At 12 years of age, she had completed primary school and was about to begin secondary school at Luttrellstown Community College. On the last Friday of summer, Michaela completed her first day at her new school. When she came home, her father recalled that she had been happy. Twelve hours later, his daughter would be dead. Michaela was still wearing her new school uniform when she left home at 9.30 that evening to meet friends. She came home by 11 p.m. as agreed with her parents and was allowed out for another half hour. At 11.30 p.m. that Friday night, Michaela begged for permission to go out again for just 15 minutes. Her parents consented. Michaela would never return. When his daughter had not come home by 2 a.m., her father knew something was seriously wrong and called Gardi to report Michaela missing. She was nowhere to be seen. The 12-year-old had seemingly vanished into thin air. Investigating her disappearance, Gardi woke Jonathan Byrne at 3.40 a.m. at his home. Immediately, the police noticed scratch marks on his arm. Jonathan didn't want to speak in front of his parents and invited Gardi into his bedroom. Alone, Jonathan told Gardi that he had seen Michaela that night, but had left her at 10 p.m. He also told them that he had only just discovered that she was 12 years of age. 
He claimed that he had been drunk, that he was an alcoholic, and he explained the scratch marks on his arm by telling them he self-harmed. He was also bold enough to suggest that police speak with the boy Michaela had dated before him. The Gardi followed up this lead, but soon discovered that Michaela's earlier boyfriend had a strong alibi. Their focus returned straight back on Jonathan. At 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, a walker made a gruesome discovery. Michaela's partially clothed body was lying in undergrowth by the banks of the Royal Canal, near playing grounds. She had been raped twice and strangled to death. A blood-stained shirt and Michaela's mobile phone were found near her body. Yesterday evening, the body of the young girl was removed to James Colliery Memorial Hospital in Blanchestown and a post-mortem is taking place this morning. This is a very sensitive case, a very difficult case for the family and friends of the deceased young girl. After the discovery of Michaela's body, Mr. Byrne took his son to the police. There, Jonathan admitted he'd been in a row with Michaela. He said he'd broken it off when he found she was only 12 years of age. He said she'd been upset at the breakup and that they fought, but that he had walked away leaving her alive. But when Byrne's father left the interview room, his son would tell the full story. In his confession, Jonathan admitted that he had indeed hit and strangled Michaela. He said he did not know what to do with Michaela's body and that he had dragged her lifeless around the field before dumping her near the canal. Later he confirmed that he had also raped her twice. Jonathan's behavior about placing the body in different locations is more a reflection of the state of trauma and panic he was in after having committed the crime. A lot of the young people that I have met over the years that, that were involved in very serious crime, including murders, uh, were people who were very impulsive. They don't think about the consequences, they believe they won't be caught, and they ask the questions later. Jonathan also admitted dropping Michaela's body a few times when carrying it. This explained her head injuries. He also owned up to drinking whiskey and cutting his arm with a blade in an attempt to disguise his wounds. That evening, at 11.30 p.m., Jonathan Byrne was formally arrested. The situation is that we have arrested a male. He was arrested last night, and he's currently in custody here, being detained on suspicion of being involved in a serious assault. We need courage to move forward from this day. Her family, our young people, and our community. The fact that Jonathan was unable or unwilling to reconcile the fact that uh, Michaela's death would have a horrendous impact on her family is an expression more of his intense focus on Michaela. She wasn't a member of a family to Jonathan. She was the loved object about whom he was obsessively fixated. One year on, Jonathan Byrne stood trial. He pleaded guilty to raping and murdering Michaela Davis. As he did so, one of Michaela's uncles hurled abuse at the teen killer. Michaela was 12 at the time of her death. Now standing in the dock, Jonathan Byrne was 19 years of age. In murder cases, we don't very often see pleas of guilty because there's no benefit in the trial because there's a mandatory life sentence. The judge handed him a life sentence for murder and also imposed two 15-year sentences for the rape charges. Just happy with the results. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Jonathan Byrne was declared a sex offender and his sentences were to run concurrently. Normally, a person who committed a murder and a rape, they seldom, if ever, got out. If I was the governor in charge of a prison and where I was asked to give an evaluation of a person like that, it is very difficult to be able to say for, with, with any degree of certainty that that person is unlikely to reoffend on either of those two things. Even a life prisoner has to go through a parole hearing at some time in the future, and the parole board will take into consideration the fact that the person has pleaded guilty, as in this case, and also that they have uh, confessed to the crime when questioned about it by the police. 
So those would be strong factors that would indicate that Jonathan Byrne at a parole hearing will have uh, much to say in his favour in terms of his remorse. Uh, and that's something that is very, very important and often overlooked in, in murder cases. Another teen killer grew up in Drimna, a working class suburb situated on the south side of Dublin city and bordered by the Grand Canal. At the age of 17, he would murder not one, but two grown men in rapid succession by stabbing them in the head with a screwdriver. The barbarity of the killings left a public wondering how Irish society could produce a boy capable of such twisted violence. That boy's name is David Curran. One of five children, criminal behavior ran in David Curran's family. His father, Michael McGurk, is a convicted tiger kidnapper. If parents are involved in criminality themselves, well then obviously that is a major a negative influence and, and, and consequence for the child, because naturally enough the child is going to be at, at, at serious risk. By the time he was 15, David Curran had a history of alcohol and drug abuse and was receiving treatment at a drugs project for young people. Now aged 17, Curran would develop from drug-taking teenager into a killer. On the day of the double murder, he was partaking in his usual pastimes. He started the day going to the off-license at 10 a.m. and buying vodka and cans of beer. He met his friend Sean Kyo and three other teenagers who cannot be named for legal reasons. Together, the teens drank booze while Curran smoked cannabis and took at least 15 benzodiazepam tablets. After consuming their alcohol, the group of five friends separated. The male teenager and two female teens moved on towards Drimna. Curran and Kyo walked to nearby Inchicore, where they proceeded to break into a factory. But it was with the three unnamed teens that the trouble started. Pavel Kalite was a 26-year-old mechanic from Poland who had been working in Ireland for 10 years. It was a Saturday and he was returning to his home after his day's work. He stopped at his local chip shop to buy some dinner. It was a decision that would end up costing him his life. When young people come together, it gives them an identity and it gives them a sense of belonging and all that. The other side is, of course, that gangs or groups have a huge negative uh, influence as well, that young, young people often have to show off. Uh, young people are often looking for attention. The madder you are, the more you're, you're liked in your group. The three members of Curran's teenage gang were loitering outside. As Pavel left the chip shop, one of the teens bumped into him on the pathway. A confrontation ensued and escalated rapidly, with all three teens launching themselves at the unsuspecting mechanic. They knocked him to the ground and Pavel was hit and kicked several times. While this was going on, an adult male stopped in his car, got out of the car and joined in. And witnesses said they were all these, th these four people were basically attacking, as they called him, the bald guy. Eventually, Pavel managed to get up and move off. And by the time he got home, he was embarrassed and ashamed. He told one housemate that he'd been attacked by stupid little punks but these punks weren't satisfied with their work so far. One of the teenagers phoned David Curran to tell him of the fight. Within minutes, Curran had arrived on the scene. He was armed with a large screwdriver which he'd stolen from a moped earlier that day. At 6.45 p.m., the gang of five, led by Curran, had located Pavel's home. From the side of the road, they screamed abuse at the Polish household. Inside, Pavel was mad with anger. So mad, in fact, that he was crying. He insisted on going outside to face the teen gang. When he came out, David Curran immediately attacked. Pavel's female housemate, who was alongside him, ducked aside. Curran swung the screwdriver with full force, and the weapon drove straight into the side of Pavel's head. Pavel received two stab wounds to the left temple, one of which penetrated his skull. The estate pathologist said that a lot of force would have been needed to break the skull and go right through and penetrate the brain and to pull the screwdriver back out of Pavel Kalite's skull. As Pavel lay dying on the street, Sean Kyo moved in and kicked him fully in the face. It transpired that Sean Kyo had 75 previous convictions and was actually released into society on bail on a series of serious charges 
when he took part in the vicious attack. Pavel's friend Marius rushed to his countryman's side to help him. Not satisfied by his bloodlust, David Curran attacked him too. He stabbed Marius with the same screwdriver, driving the tool deep into the Polish man's temple. The attack had lasted seconds. Two innocent men lay dying on the ground. The five teenagers fled the scene. Pavel and Marius would never regain consciousness. They would die days later from their injuries. The double murder of the two Polish men caused a public outcry. The Taoiseach Bertie Ahern was on a visit to Poland at the time of the killings and made a public statement of condolence whilst standing alongside the Polish Prime Minister. A sad event and one we deeply regret and I'd like to pass on my sympathies and condolences to their families here in Poland. None of this mattered to Curran or his gang. On the night of the killings, they conspired to develop a web of lies and cover-ups. It's very common uh, for young gangs, for young people, to be incapable of committing the perfect crime, if you will. By definition, a lot of them tend to be quite impulsive, so they just don't simply plan ahead. They don't plan for themselves, and they can't seem to network amongst themselves. They're not thinking beyond the crime, so the crime is a, a very immediate thing. It happens, and then they don't, just simply don't know what to do. Curran and one of the girls tried to concoct an alibi. That girl later lied to police denying she and Curran had been in contact at all. But there had been four phone calls and multiple texts between them that night. Police later found the following message saved in a draft folder on the girl's phone. The amateur cover-up continued as the teenage girl also texted Sean Kyo. He replied, Kyo later texted, When David Curran was arrested by police, the gang's loyalty evaporated. Curran lied and told police that his friend Sean Kyo had done the stabbing. When Kyo was arrested, he told police another teen had done it, but refused to name Curran. The most simplistic and perhaps most valid understanding is the fact that he was, at the time of the crime and before the crime, heavily abusing alcohol and drugs. This is a very volatile mix that destabilizes the brain's ability to moderate its impulses. It's not a justification for it, but it is one of the consequences of the prevalence of drugs and alcohol in our society today. My sympathy for those families, I, I, I cannot extend it enough. It, it's rare you will hear of such a horrific level of violence in Ireland or indeed anywhere globally. Two years after Pavel and Marius were killed, David Curran and Sean Kyo stood trial at the Central Criminal Court. Curran denied the double murder, but admitted to manslaughter due to provocation. Now, under Irish law, provocation is assessed under what's called a subjective test. You look at what the accused person with his or her particular circumstances, family background, how they might have reacted to the provocation rather than the ordinary reasonable person. Curran claimed he had been told by his gang that his father had been stabbed by Pavel and that his actions were provoked. Provocation is the total and complete loss of self-control which is supposed to be sudden. And that seems to have been a particular difficulty in the defence of this particular case because the facts didn't appear to point to a sudden and a complete loss of self-control. His story didn't stand up. After a three-week trial, David Curran was found guilty of murdering both Pavel and Marius. Now aged 19, he received a mandatory life sentence and 20 years in prison. As the verdict came down, none of Curran's family were present in court to offer support. Sean Kyo was found not guilty on both murder counts, but was found guilty of assault causing harm. The other teenagers involved in the violent affray of Pavel that led to the murders were let go with no charges brought against them. 
Pavel Kalite's heartbroken sister being comforted by Gardi and her brother's former employer, Alan Kennedy, who read victim impact statements to the court on behalf of the families of the two men. Every day, two dads go to a graveyard to keep two graves. Marius family and Pavel's family, all they're left with are memories and heartache. Not all teen killers come from gangland or urban backgrounds. Mount Melek is a medium-sized rural town situated at a bend on the Oanas River at the eastern edge of the Sleeve Bloom Mountains in County Leash. With a population of over 4,000 people, it has four national schools and one community school. In 1988, Mount Melek teenager Olive Goodwin gave birth to a baby boy. She would name him Darren. The boy's father, David Horan, was also a teenager. Like many teens thrust into parenthood, the couple would not stay together. Instead, Darren was reared by his mum and her parents in the centre of town. Even though Darren's father lived just outside Mount Melek, Darren had no contact with him and he played no role in his life. According to his mother, Darren never showed any violence towards anyone throughout his young life. When Darren became a teenager, that would change with tragic consequences. He would go so far out of control that it would become frightening for everybody. Something happened in the very early years of adolescence, and his entire personality and behavioral profile changed radically. It's almost as if something has been simmering, simmering, and simmering, and finally come to the boil. In his 15th year, Darren Goodwin was taking a turn for the worse. He was suspended from his secondary school and was causing difficulties at home. I came to the conclusion uh, over the years that what was required was a appropriate intervention at the appropriate time. Because if the uh, intervention doesn't take place at the appropriate time, often the child is lost. All Darren's life, he'd lived with his mother and his grandparents in the center of Mount Melek. Now, in a bid to control him, it was felt a strong male influence might bring him some discipline. An arrangement was made whereby Darren would move in with his father. The move was designed to keep Darren out of trouble. It didn't work. Darren didn't know his father, and he's removed and ripped from all his familiar to a stranger's home. And this caused within him deep-seated anger. Anger that he held and ultimately expressed about the father, but I would suspect that there's also a deep sense of betrayal towards the mother. Having never known the father who had been absent from his life, the move would stir up in Darren Goodwin emotions that he could not or would not control. It would unleash a cold-hearted desire to murder his father or someone else. Instead of keeping him on the rails, Darren Goodwin was now stepping into an abyss. In September 2003, unable to cope with his emotions, Darren tried to take his own life. Darren's suicide attempt is an expression of his deep rage and anger about what's happened in his life, and it was turned inward and directed against him. After his suicide attempt, Darren was brought to St. Fintan's Hospital in Port Leash, but within a short time, he was released. Olive Goodwin claims the hospital told her that there was nothing wrong with him. Fatefully, Darren returned to live with his father and also returned to school. The anger, resentment and murderous desire boiling inside him remained unchecked. By now, Darren was also running into other problems. He had sold a mobile phone to a local man. However, the phone had turned out to be faulty. When the buyer complained, Darren promised he'd get a replacement. The significance of this pledge would seal the fate of another teenager, 14-year-old Dara Conroy. Dara was the only child of Patricia and Jack Conroy. He was into music, liked art and loved skateboarding. Earlier that month, his mum had bought him a new mobile phone, a gold and cream Nokia. The idea was that she could stay in touch with him while he was out playing. Dara kept it with him everywhere he went, giving his mum peace of mind. Little did she know her son's life was in danger. By now, Darren's father was increasingly concerned about his son's mental state. 
so much so that he arranged a joint visit to a local psychotherapist. Parents are often blamed by the public and by the media. Why didn't the parents do A, B and C? And, and I have nothing but empathy and sympathy for the parents of children nowadays, teenagers, uh, because I have met parents who are terrific parents, who did their very, very level best, who were good in every sense of that word, and still a child ended up in difficulty. His father's suspicion was well-founded. Darren was out with two classmates when he expressed a desire that would shock the teenagers. He told them that he'd love to kill someone, someone that no one would care about, someone like Dara Conroy. None of them believed him. At the tender age of 15, Darren Goodwin was about to realize his murderous potential. On the afternoon of his psychotherapist appointment, Darren visited his grandmother and asked her, could he borrow a hammer? She couldn't find one to give him. Undaunted, Darren took a round-headed hammer from his school's metalwork class. There were no witnesses to what happened in an area of waste ground known locally as Smith's Field that afternoon. There was nobody to call out to, nobody to ask what was going on, nobody to shout stop. There was nobody to help a young 14-year-old boy as his life ended violently. When Patricia Conroy returned home, she became concerned about her son. She assumed he was out with friends. Knowing he would have his mobile phone with him, she rang him, but got an out-of-service message. The phone was new, it was charged and had credit. Patricia knew something was not right. What was wrong was that Dara's phone was no longer with its owner. Darren paid a visit to the man who he had sold a faulty phone to. In his possession was a new Nokia mobile phone with a cream back and gold front. Darren gave it to him and walked away. I suspect that for Darren, Dara was just an object, not a human being. And the phone was something of some value that could be returned to someone to gain some sense of self-worth and being a, a proper criminal, so to speak. Darren and his father kept their appointment with the psychotherapist in Mount Melick. As he sat there answering questions about his feelings and emotions, neither his father nor the therapist interviewing him could know the awful truth about the teenager sitting before them. By now, Patricia Conroy was searching frantically for her son. She still couldn't get an answer on Dara's mobile phone and continued searching into the night. That evening, Darren confessed what he had done to another Mount Melick teen. He said, I hit him in the head with a hammer. Darren also told one of his friends over the phone that he was after killing someone and leaving him down the banks. It was just before midnight when Dara's lifeless body was found at Smith's Field. His head had been hit six times with a hammer. Five of the blows had been delivered while he lay on the ground and had been struck in rapid succession. A crime scene was immediately established around the site. The next day, Mount Melick was in shock. Local children looked on as Dara's body was removed. He was in second year in our school like, and he was younger years than us, but he was just so quiet like you wouldn't expect something like this to happen to him. He's friendly with everyone, like he wouldn't harm a fly like. After several classmates told police of his murderous comments earlier in the week, Darren Goodwin was arrested by Gardaí. Gardaí and Port Leash have arrested a 15-year-old teenager in connection with Dara Conroy's death. He will have to be released or charged later this evening. Darren was seen by psychiatric professionals to assess his state of mind. In these interviews, Darren was asked why he killed Dara. He replied that he was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. His clinical psychologist reported that he was still a significant risk to his father. When asked if he could flick a switch and swap his father's death for Dara's, Darren Goodwin had answered, yes, I would. Dara Conroy's life stopped at 14 years of age. By the time Darren Goodwin stood trial for his murder, he was 16. As he stood in the dock in the Central Criminal Court, Goodwin submitted a not guilty plea. Throughout the trial, 
his attitude was indifferent. If you don't identify the humanity in that person, well then there's a very poor chance that that person will ever identify the humanity in somebody else. On the eighth day of the trial, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. Although a murder conviction normally carries a mandatory life sentence, in the case of a minor, a judge has discretion to impose a lesser sentence. Patricia Conroy, wearing the red polo neck, broke down in tears today as she spoke of her son. She said the pain of losing her only child is indescribable. Darren Goodwin was led away in handcuffs to begin his life sentence. In the Darren Goodwin case, the judge determined that a life sentence was the appropriate sentence, but he put it in for review, which meant that in 10 years' time, he would review the case and determine if things had changed. 10 years after that day, the sentence was reviewed. As Darren was 15 when he murdered Dara, it was deemed difficult to assess his mind as it had not fully developed. Human personality isn't fully developed until the early 20s. At age 15, it's still a piece in progress. So that at that age, it's really difficult to come to definitive answers about the formation of all the huge amount of pushes and pulls that are involved in what we call our personality. Well, internationally, it is now accepted that when children are involved in crime, uh, and it is a murder crime, that they are redeemable, that they can uh, change, and that they can provide to society in the future. A release date was set, but Darren was instructed to receive therapy twice a week, as the issue of remorse had not been fully addressed. We can only paint a picture of their personality, their drives and their impulse control but we can't ever come to an absolute chipped in granite conclusion about how dangerous they might be in the future. Darren Goodwin is set for release in July 2016. I met young people who were psychopaths. They had no feelings at all. Equally, I met young people who had serious regrets, uh, were devastated. How do they actually feel inwardly themselves in the cell or in the, in the room when they're locked up every night, uh, seven nights a week? I believe that many of them do actually feel, uh, you know, remorse. They do regret what they did. 